Well, we are continuing in this series, and um, I don't even remember what part we are in. Is this the fifth week or the sixth week? So you can go back and and find messages that, that you've missed. But we're talking about the fire of God. And we've been talking this whole time about how the Levitical priest in Leviticus 6 um, were responsible to keep the fire of God burning on the altar. In Leviticus, Moses had established an altar and God had set fire upon that altar. And then he said, it is the priest's responsibility to make sure that the fire on that altar never goes out. Say it with me. Let the fire never go out. And then Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, give him praise. Give him praise today. He's worthy. Then Jesus came in, the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. Did you hear what I just said? He is the fulfillment of every single messianic prophecy. He fulfilled it all. And now through his finished work on the cross, through his death, burial, resurrection, and through his blood that was shed for each of us, now we have been brought into the family of God through the new covenant, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Give him praise for that today. And now in the new covenant, God says, you, all of you who put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, now you have become priest unto the Lord. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility to every day continually tend the fire of God that burns on the altar of our heart and burns in the altars in our homes and burns in the altars in our church. And what does that look like? It's a holy fire. It's a purifying fire. It's not cold, dead religion, friends. How many of you have seen the difference? You've seen cold, dead religion where people come in like zombies and they go through the motions and they sit and they're entertained and they come in one way and they leave the same. They're no different from the rest of the world. God said, my people are going to be different. You're going to be set apart unto me. You're going to be holy and my fire is going to burn in your hearts, in your homes and in your churches. So you will make a difference in the world. That's what he's called you to. And that's what he's called me to. It's what he's called radiant to. So we are talking about how do we maintain the spiritual fire? How do we keep it burning in our hearts continually? Because as we do, we will continue to grow spiritually. And that is God's, his desire, his plan for every single one of us. None of us are meant to stay immature Christians. And, and I think that's one of the saddest things to see as a pastor is when you see people who have been Christians for decades, you see people who have been Christians for many years, some of them multiple decades, and they're still spiritually immature. They're still full of themselves, self-absorbed. They've never grown. They've never truly Learn to do what Jesus said his disciples would do. Deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow in Jesus' footsteps. So the Lord said, you have to go back to the first things. You have to go back to the first things, the primary things that I've shown you to do. And you have to teach my people what to do to tend the fire, to fan the fire into flame, and to continue to grow spiritually mature and healthy. So that's where we're at today. And we're going to begin with Colossians 4.12. And this is from the J.B. Phillips translation. This is a prayer that Epaphras prayed, and it's a prayer that is so significant that the Holy Spirit inspired it, and God said, I want this written in my word for all of my children. And this is the prayer, that you may become mature Christians and may fulfill God's will for you. And I know across America, churches are filled with people who come in and go out every week and never fulfill God's will for their life. And, and I'm not blaming them. I say it's the responsibility of the pastors to teach, to lead, and to provoke. To provoke the children of God to not stay spiritually immature. Listen, 
Paul said a lot of wonderful things up here, but I think the most wonderful thing he said is that we are willing to say what may make you not like us. Because we love you, we love God, and we want to see God's will fulfilled in your life. And I hope, I think you're grateful and thankful to have pastors here that won't allow you to just sit on your derriere and be a lazy dog sleeping by the fire. And the re <laughs> thank you. Okay, those are some on fire Christians that shouted right there. You know, um, I'm going to deviate a little bit for just a minute. Uh, this is day 21 of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we had over 200 people in the church who've been fasting and praying together with us. And we want to thank you all for, for fasting and praying in one accord with us. Um, it's been one of the most significant fasts of my life. The second week into the fast, I was in the, my war room, my closet under the stairs, and I shut myself in there for hours and hours during the fast. And I had been in there, I don't know, two and a half, three hours. And, and the, Lord, the Lord gave me a vision and he took me back to the garden of Gethsemane. Remember when Jesus prayed before the Roman soldiers came to take him away to be crucified? And, and he prayed so intensely that he had a physical condition where the layers of his skin, his epidermis separated and he sweat drops of blood. And the scripture says great drops of blood. And, and what the Lord was showing me is he, he was showing me, Kelly, this, this prayer, this kind of prayer that I entered into is an uncommon prayer. It's an uncommon prayer and most never experience it. And he showed me that he went to each of his disciples and pleaded with them to come, to join him in a place of uncommon prayer. I don't believe he intends for any of us to sweat great drops of blood. But there are strategic times in history and in my life and in your life and in our world where that kind of uncommon prayer is necessary. And, and just, just praying a, a quick little list of prayers and, or just praying quickly through our prayers to, to get it over with, to get in and get out, is not going to cut it. He's saying the time that you're in right now, and this was before we had anything on the radar concerning Israel. But he said, right now, I'm calling my disciples like I did then because you are in such a strategic, critical moment in history. And he said, I need my disciples to enter into a place of uncommon prayer. And so I don't have time to do a teaching on that. I'm going to encourage you, ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, show me what uncommon prayer looks like for me and where you want us to go in uncommon prayer. And I believe if you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit at the end of this service. There will be prayer team members down here who will pray for you. Because I'm telling you, in situations like this, I don't know how to pray as I ought, according to Romans 6, 26. And thank God the Holy Spirit can intercede through me. And the Bible says when he intercedes through me, I'm praying mysteries to God. It's the Father's heart through the Holy Spirit praying through me. And I don't understand it, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit know exactly what's being prayed. And that's when miracles can happen. But the Lord, yeah, go ahead, give him praise. He has not left us without power in these last days, but it's up to each one of us to seek him diligently with all of our hearts so that we will find him and so that we will be endued with that power. But the Lord was showing me in the prayer closet how even Peter, James, and John his three closest friends, even those three were not willing to crucify their flesh and give up a little sleep to enter into that place of uncommon prayer with Jesus. And I believe he's calling us today, church, to go to the next level of spiritual maturity. Go to the next level of prayer, a place of uncommon prayer, a new place of uncommon praise that you've never been before, a new place of uncommon worship, a new place of uncommon devotion to the word of God. I believe that's what he's asking of his church today. And that's my prophetic part of this message. Now I have to get back to the rest of the notes. But 
But something that I saw when I was in the prayer closet, I wanted to read it in all these different translations, uh, the whole record, the whole account of Jesus in the garden. And Eugene Peterson put it in a way that we all will understand and it will stay with us. Because Jesus, when he went back and he kept finding the disciples asleep, and, and, and I want you to understand many of the church today is asleep. And, but, and God's calling on each of us to provoke them, to awaken them. And, but I love what Eugene Peterson said. He said, when Jesus went and found them sleeping, he said, you are like a lazy dog sleeping by the fire. And I thought, that is amazing. What a word picture. And I thought, and in this hour, God is sending his church that is awake and saying, go nudge them, go provoke them. Joel chapter two, sound the alarm, awaken the people. It's time, it's time, it's time. And when we go to those Christians that are sleeping and we try to nudge them and provoke them, crucify your flesh. That means your carnal nature, your selfish nature, your selfish desires. What happens when you try to provoke a sleeping, lazy dog sleeping by the fire? <laughs> And let me tell you, on this Pastor Appreciation Month, we've gotten a lot of that. I'm not saying just from within this church, but the body of Christ as a whole. And I'm not saying that so you feel sorry for us. Don't feel sorry for us. We're like the hippo. We have thick skin <laughs> um, because of the Holy Spirit. But what I am saying is don't be like a lazy dog sleeping by the fire. And when people who love you enough to tell you the truth come alongside of you and say, we want you to fulfill the whole will of God for your life. So you need to wake up and you need to go to the next level of spiritual growth and maturity. Say, thank you. Thank you for caring enough to teach me and to lead me like this. And if you get offended, listen, if you get offended when the the people of God, the pastors, the, the leaders of the body of Christ come along and try to wake you up and sound the alarm to get you to fulfill God's will and purpose for your life. If you get offended, it's because you're a lazy dog sleeping by the fire. Ooh. All right, you guys can all say, we love you, Pastor Kelly. Even if you don't, fake it till you make it. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15 says, we are not meant to remain as children, but to grow up in every way into Christ. And let me tell you, if you go to a church where they will not provoke you and will not stir you, will not awaken you, will not challenge you to grow spiritually, but instead they'll baby you and pamper you, put on a nice little entertaining show, just make you feel good. So you just come in, feel good, go out the same. Um, again, you're a sleeping dog. You're a lazy dog sleeping by the fire. And any church that does that does not really love God and does not really love you. Because those who truly love the Lord and love his people want to see God's, all of God's will fulfilled in your life. Amen? All right. We're talking about spiritual growth and maturity. And so we've got to talk about some heavy duty things when we talk about that. So we all start out as babies in Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. You may think you're a high and mighty, intelligent professor, or maybe even a theologian, or you're very respected in the community. And, and you come to Jesus Christ, and the Bible says you're a baby. All of us come to Christ the same way. When we're born again, we start out as baby Christians, but none of us are intended to stay babies. We're all intended to grow up. It makes me think of this last year when Faith and I planted a small little garden in our backyard. And uh, we didn't just take some plants and stick them in the ground and walk away and hope for the best. And yet sometimes that's what we do in the body of Christ. We ask people to raise your hand if you want to receive Jesus today. We'll pray a little prayer with you. And then we send you on your way and hope for the best. And that's not at all what God intended. Babies have to have others who will care for them, who will nurture them, who will teach them, who will train them and help them to grow. And, and I think about when we stuck those plants in the ground, 
we got a little greenhouse thing, a little plastic covering, because we have lots of rabbits, lots of deer, and lots of hail in Colorado. But thankfully, we didn't have a whole lot this year, right? We can praise God for that. <laughs> but... But we had to protect it from those elements. And, and we elevated the garden so that the heavy rains wouldn't erode it and wash it away. And we had to place it strategically in the sunlight so that it would get sufficient sunlight. Get it? Sunlight. It had to be in the presence of the sun in order to grow and mature as it needed to. And we had to water it. And what do we do? We water the seed God plants in us with the word of God. And so the same is true for us. We don't get saved and come into the kingdom and just stay babies. And we don't just hope for the best and hope we somehow grow and mature. No, we have to be intentional. So we're gonna look at what is spiritual growth. And in a nutshell, spiritual growth is being like Jesus. It's not how much you know. It doesn't, it's not how many times you've read the Bible. It's not how proficient you are in quoting scripture. It's not how many times you come to church every week or how high you jump in praise and worship. No, the, the reality is, are you becoming more like Jesus? And, and I think it would be very wise for us to ask the people that know us the best. When you look at my life, would you say, I'm becoming more like Jesus? And there are two very good questions that you and I could ask ourselves on a regular basis. The first one is, am I loving Jesus more? Are you loving him more than you did at the first? Are you loving him more than you did three years ago? Are you loving him more and more and more and more? Because when you're growing spiritually, that's what happens. I've been passionately following Jesus, I believe, th for 37 years now. And I can tell you, I am so much more in love with him today than I was even the day I got radically saved. And, and we need to ask ourselves, am I loving Jesus more? And the second one's like it. Am I loving people more? Because if you say, I love Jesus, but I hate people, you, <laughs> you're like a little baby with a stinky, poopy diaper, and, and, and everywhere you go, everyone is repulsed by your smell. It's time to change your diaper, put on big boy pants or big girl pants, and grow up and become more like Jesus. Amen? I'm sorry, guys. I just don't, I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> but healthy growth doesn't just happen without taking necessary steps. So that's what we're going to look at today. And uh, if you have your phone, you can pull up the Radiant app and you can find the sermon notes and follow along there. So principles of growth. The first one we need to look at in order to maintain the fire, in order to grow spiritually, is fellowship. We have to have fellowship with God to grow spiritually. If you don't have fellowship with him, but you're, you're going through the motions, you have cold, dead religion with no relationship. And that's not God's plan. Spiritual growth isn't a matter of keeping a set of rules and regulations. That's legalism and bondage. But rather, it is a personal, intimate, daily relationship with God. And that's what God desires with each and every one of us. An intimate, personal relationship. I am telling you, and my family will tell you, my favorite place on the whole planet is the closet under the stairs in our basement. Because that's where I follow Jesus' instruction. When he said, go into your inner room, a private room, and shut the door. He's saying, shut everything else out, shut everyone else out, shut yourself up alone with God so that you can intimately fellowship with him. You can be open and honest and you can press into his heart diligently. Jeremiah 29, 12. Everybody quotes Jeremiah 29, 11. But let's go on to the next verses, 12 and 13, where it says, when you seek me diligently with all of your heart, requiring intimacy with me. That's the amplified text. God said, when you seek me like that, then you will find me. And he did not make any exceptions. I have had so many people through the years say, Pastor Kelly, how, how is it that 
that you hear God, you hear his whispers, and, and you have this intimate relationship with them. And first of all, I have to tell them, we've, you got, you've got to understand, I've been walking with him for 37 years, and, and I've been growing spiritually for 37 years. But I learned a long time ago that if I want true intimacy with him, I have to be willing to go the distance. It's, it, it's not going to happen just like sticking a few plants in the ground and walking away. It's not going to happen on its own. I have to desperately desire it so that I am seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I'm shutting myself up with God in a closet under the stairs for hours on a regular basis. I am going to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying, I have to hear from you. I have to hear from you. Oh God, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And it takes crucifying our flesh flesh, our carnal nature, our natural human reasoning, burning our schedules, our plans, our agendas, our calendars. Some of us are so busy doing so many things, we can't even hear Jesus at the door knocking, 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 knocking. If anyone hears my knocking and will open the door, I will come in and sup with you. I will have fellowship with you. And we get so busy in the church, so busy with our own agenda, our own plans, our own schedules, our own passions, that we can't even hear him knocking. And he's not on the inside with us. He's on the outside saying, please let me in. I want intimacy with you. I want fellowship with you. And I'm going to tell you something that I believe is an absolute guarantee. You will never know true deep intimacy with, with God as long as you are constantly looking in a device. Those little devices that we carry around with us everywhere we go, I believe that they are devices from hell in many ways. There may be some good, there may be some blessings in it, but I think in large part, they keep us distracted and they keep us from shutting everything else out and being able to hear him. Come on, are you with me here today? I'm passionate about this because I love him and I love you. And I know I'm not special. I, and I, I don't say that with a sense of false humility. I know I'm not. I know he loves every one of you every bit as much as he loves me. And he wants intimate fellowship with you too, but you have to avail yourself to him. And my goodness, look at the time. So the first one is fellowship. In order to become more like Jesus, we must cultivate an intimate relationship with him. It has to be your highest priority. And I'll tell you, sometimes, and I think we failed teenagers and kids sometimes when everybody needs friends, but sometimes we push them towards their friends so much that their friends and all of the extracurricular activities squeeze out their most important relationship in their life, and that's their relationship with God. And uh, many times we do that in our own lives. But number one, God created us to love us and to enjoy a personal relationship with us. He didn't create you so that you could be a puppet on strings and he'd be the great puppet master in heavens, uh, in the heavens, dictating what you do and how you do it. No, he created you to have a loving relationship with you. Just as he did Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman. And it says that they walked with him in the cool of the day. They walked with him in the garden. Adam walked with God and talked with him in the garden in the cool of the day. And I think of that so often when Pastor Todd heads out the door early every morning to walk with God. And that man walks thousands and thousands and thousands of miles every year because he walks with God. He loves to go on prayer walks. And uh, whatever that needs to look like for you to develop and cultivate an intimate relationship with God, just do it. Number two, God delights in his children knowing him and being in fellowship with him. He delights, he delights when you want to know him. When you get into the word and say, God, I don't want this to just be printed words on a page. I want to come to know you more deeply and love you more fully as I get into your word. And as you shut yourself up with him, it delights his heart. He delights in spending time with you. Number three, when we sin, our fellowship with God is broken because all of us sin. All of us mess up from time to time. 
Most of us, I mess up pretty much on a daily basis, even after 30 years of walking with Christ. Last night, I couldn't find the church keys and I blamed my kids. And uh, today I repent publicly. I said, you kids, I'm never giving you my church keys again. You, you lost them. And then I went this morning and found them. They had slipped through a hole and they were in the lining of my purse. And so I had to come back and repent. And Faith is over there smiling really big. All of us mess up. Um, and when we sin, it breaks our fellowship with God. It doesn't break our relationship with God. I'm still his daughter. When our kids sin, our kids sin on a regular basis. And when they sin, I'm still their mom. I still love them very much. My love for them doesn't change. Our relationship doesn't change, but our fellowship does until they come to me or until, in the case of last night, I come to them and repent until we humble ourselves and and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. I failed. And this is how I failed. Would you please forgive me? And 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Give him praise for that today. Aren't you glad God doesn't hold grudges? Number four, when we sin, we need to run to God. When you sin... Don't don't run from him like Adam and Eve in the garden and try to hide your sin from him. No, run to him. Run to him and not from him. Because when we confess our sin to God, our fellowship is immediately restored. His mercies are new every morning. Some of you, you, someone here may be here today or watching online and, and maybe you've messed up and you know your fellowship with God has been broken because you've been living in sin. And God is here today, not with a scowl on his face, but he's here with his outstretched arms and a loving smile, waiting to embrace you, just waiting for you to come back to him in radical humility and say, oh God, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And then he washes you again and cleanses you of all unrighteousness. He's so good. The next principle we're gonna look at is lordship. And I think as Christians, we have to surrender lordship every day, don't we? Boy, it, unless, unless you are like way more mature than me, every day I have to surrender lordship to him. It says spiritual growth is not taking greater command of your life. It is giving Christ more control of your life. So it's not about us having more of the Holy Spirit, but it's about allowing the Holy Spirit to have more of us. It's every day waking up and saying, Holy Spirit, I'm working with you today. You're in charge. Please lead me, guide me, direct me, empower me so that I will bring glory and honor and praise to God the Father and to Jesus the Son. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So we've got to settle the lordship issue. And again, I say on a daily basis, saying, I'm not here to do my own will. And you know what? You're not here to do your own will. We're not here to do our own bidding. We are here to do his, amen? Amen. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and to love others as we love ourselves. So when when we stop thinking the world revolves around us, and we stop being self-consumed and self-obsessed, then we begin to grow spiritually. And the fire, the oil of God, the oil of the Holy Spirit is poured upon that fire and it grows brighter and hotter. And here's the reality for each of us when it comes to lordship. Number one, God owns us by creation and by redemption. So we're doubly his. We are doubly his. You know, um, Pastor Todd's mom, I love my mother-in-law. I know she's watching right now. I love you so much, Mama Hudnall. Uh, But Todd tells about when he was a boy and uh, his mom would do VBS out of the garage. 
And he said, she told a story he has never forgotten about a little boy who built a sailboat. I mean, he lovingly worked on that sailboat for hours and hours and hours and hours. And he finally completed it and it was a masterpiece. So he wrote his name on the bottom of the boat and he headed out to the lake. He had a string attached to it and he put it out on the water. But a big gust of wind came up and blew his boat into the middle of the lake, his string snapped and he couldn't retrieve it. Well, he was heartbroken. He had invested so much time in creating that precious beloved boat. So he went away sad and dejected. And then many, many weeks, maybe months later, he goes by a pawn shop and he happens to look in the window of a pawn shop and he sees his beloved boat. He's so excited. He runs in. He tells the owner of the pawn shop, that's my boat. That's my boat. I made that boat. And the pawn shop owner says, oh, no, it's not. I paid for that boat. And the little boy, again, was disappointed because he didn't have the money to pay for the boat. So he went home, and then he worked for weeks and weeks and weeks to raise the money, went back in the pawn shop, and bought back his boat. And when he left, he kissed that boat and he said, boat, you're not only mine, but you are doubly mine. I created you and I bought you back. And that's exactly what God says to you. You are not only his, but you are doubly his. He created you and he bought you back with his very own blood. Give him praise today. And based on that truth, number two, we are obligated to make Jesus the Lord over every area of our lives. Not part of our lives, but all of our lives. Let's move on. Number three, submitting to Christ's Lordship places us in a position for maximum blessing. Oh, who doesn't want that? The more you surrender to him, the more blessing you receive. Isn't that true, Paul and Deborah? I know you guys have experienced that with us. Maximum fulfillment. The more you surrender to him, the more fulfilled you are. I talk to so many Christians that are dissatisfied and discontented and disgruntled, and some are even questioning God's goodness and faithfulness. And I know every time it goes back to a lordship issue, Pastor Jenny. It goes back to a lordship issue because when we surrender everything to him, then we suddenly become the most contented people in the universe because it's no longer about me. It's no longer about my needs, my desires, my passions, my wants, my flesh. It's all about him. And I cannot tell you or describe to you in human words how incredibly freeing that is and how fulfilling it is. The more you just surrender lordship to him, the more fulfilled you are, the maximum fellowship you have, yeah, you know, I believe that's been a key to my own walk with him. That, that, that when I stay surrendered to him, I can hear him more clearly. And finally, maximum power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on to number four. Surrendering to the Lordship of Christ requires, first of all, accepting God's rule. Accepting God's rule. That means if Jesus is Lord, I'm not. How many of you say Jesus Christ is Lord? Go ahead, lift up your hand. Listen, if you really believe that, you're gonna lift it up high and very passionately. Now, guess what? If Jesus is Lord, you're not. Woo, hallelujah. Oh, so stop trying to control people. Stop condemning and ridiculing and criticizing and gossiping and and backbiting and stop complaining and being negative because every time you and I do that, we're like a little Bible, like a little, little baby crawling around with a poopy diaper, just smelling up the place. And God's saying, it's time to grow up and mature. Get your stinky little diaper off, put your big girl pants on and become more like Jesus. And it is phenomenal what, how, how much freedom, how much joy you experience when we do that. It, it requires that we place Christ over all in our life. And it requires that we give up all our personal rights. That means, beloved Christian, you and I have no right to ever be offended ever again. 
Paul is the only one in this whole place that said amen. Let me say that again. If Jesus is Lord, you and I, you watching online, never have a right to be offended ever again. If anyone ever had a right to be offended, it was Jesus himself. Jesus had every right to be offended. And the Bible says, yet there was no offense in him. And what did Jesus say? If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself. That means give up your rights. Take up your cross. Give your life away, serving him by serving others. And he said, and follow me, follow my example. I do not have enough time to get through all this. Number five, accepting Christ's lordship means recognizing your place as a steward. And that means, guys, God owns everything. He owns it all. You know what? Your big truck that you love, that you work so hard to make the payments on, your beautiful home, whatever it is, God owns it all. And he just makes us a steward over it for a period of time. And he expects us to manage what he has given us to steward and to manage it, steward it well. And that means our time, every one of us has a certain amount of time on earth and none of us knows how long we have. But we need to get up every day, wake up every day as mature believers, surrender to the Lord. And this is so freeing when you do it. And realizing, okay, Lord, I have so much time in my day today. How do you want me to spend it? And some of us need to sit down with our schedules and our agendas and say, Lord, what is on our calendar or on my calendar that you do not want me to be a part of anymore? And we need to let him eliminate things, eliminate competing distractions from off of our calendars. Talent. Some of us, all of us have a talent. We have talents. Some of us are, have more than one talent. And you can go in your own time and go to Matthew 25 and read the parable of the talents. But, you know, I can't help but think of Angie Rutowski, who made this beautiful flower arrangement. I cannot do this. I can try. I will make a big mess. And it will take me a lot of time and a lot of frustration, and it will not turn out anywhere near this pretty. (laughs) But, But Angie, that's a talent, and she uses it to honor God. She uses it to, to decorate for embrace grace, for those embrace grace mamas who are single and, and are saying, I'm not going to abort my child. I'm going to raise this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, and all of us have talents and, and God's just waiting to see, how are you going to use your talents? Use them for his glory. Treasure, we all have, we have treasure. We have resources, finances, and and it's important that we steward them well. Our temple, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, And sometimes we abuse our bodies with substances. I'll tell you one thing that I abuse my body with is sugar. And that's one of the most wonderful things every time I fast is I always eliminate sugar. And, and we've done no meat, no sweets, and uh, every day we fasted meals. And I'll tell you, I have so much more energy, and I feel so much better physically when I eliminate sugar. So I feel like the Lord's talking to me and saying, take care of your temple. You need to get the sugar out of your diet. Another one is your testimony. Because the Bible tells us, through the Apostle Paul, we are living epistles known and read by everyone. We're walking billboards for Jesus. So when we say I'm a Christian and we live like the devil or we live like the rest of the world, we're giving a bad testimony. So we want to manage our testimony well. and, And the only way we can do that is surrendering lordship. And finally, I will be held accountable for my stewardship. One day we're all going to stand before the Lord. And, and he's not going to say, Kelly, Did you live your life according to the approval of men? Did, Kelly, did you spend your time and live out your days to get the applause and the praise of people? Because if that's what I did, I'm going to be, I'm going to be very, I'm going to be very shamed, very ashamed that, Lord, I I blew it. Now, he's still going to receive me. He's still going to love me. But I don't know about you. When I come before the Lord, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful. You were faithful. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Is anybody else living like that? 
And I'm telling you, when you choose to live like that, it's not bondage. It's, man, I just, I want to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. And, and I want to love others as I love myself because he's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the lamb of God, the crucified savior who went to the cross in my place. I can tell you right now, I deserved crucifixion because my sins are so many. I deserved crucifixion. But I'll never have to face that. I'll never have to face condemnation and judgment because he went in my place. This isn't religion. It's not legalism. It's, oh my goodness, Jesus, how can I love you more? How can I worship you more? How can I serve you more? Give him praise today. We're almost done. The next section is dependence. We have to be dependent if we're going to grow spiritually because spiritual growth doesn't mean becoming independent of Christ. It's becoming more dependent upon him. It's understanding what John did when he said, I must decrease so that he can increase. That I've been walking with him, passionately loving him for like 37 years. And after 37 years, I'm not up here going, look at me, I am a spiritual Arnold Schwarzenegger. I am a spiritual giant. No, I'm up here saying, the longer I walk with him, the more I realize, apart from him, I am wretched and poor, naked and blind. I have nothing and I can do nothing apart from him. Spiritual maturity is becoming more radically humble and dependent upon him. So number one, I have to recognize my absolute need for Christ. To grow spiritually, I have to recognize, oh God, I need you. That old hymn, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, we need him, don't we? For those of you who don't know that hymn, go back and look it up. You'll be blessed. Number two, to grow spiritually, I must trust his strength in my weakness. The day I start trusting in my own strength, in my own ability, in my own wisdom, in my own plans, in my own agenda, ooh, that's all pride and it stinks. It's a poopy diaper. Pride stinks in its various forms. And when I start thinking, oh, I know what to do, I know how to handle this. I know how to manage this. I'm leaning on my own understanding. I'm disqualified. He can't use those kind of people. He's not like the Marines that are looking for the bold, the proud, the strong, the Marines. That's the Marines. That's not God. God's looking for the humble, the dependent, the weak, because those are the ones that he can work through because it's when we're weak, that his strength is made perfect. Praise him for that today. (laughs) Number three, allow the life of Christ to flow through you. To grow spiritually, we have to allow the life of Christ to flow through us. And when we do, the fruit of the spirit that will be evident is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So let the love of God and let his life flow through you. And finally, discipleship. Spiritual growth is not immediate, but it's a process. So be patient. If you come in here today and say, oh, me, oh, my, I have a long way to go. That's okay. We all do. And listen, we will not stop growing until we breathe our last breath here and enter into eternity with him. When I'm 90 years old, I'm still going to be growing and maturing spiritually. And so are you. So be patient. When, when a baby starts to learn, a toddler starts to learn to walk, and I'm so excited, Brayton, your toddler will be here before you know it. And oh, Topher and Elizabeth are sitting here with, by the way, I have a baby gift for you guys. So um, I think it's, it's right down here. Don't leave without it. But I think about those with little toddlers. When they start to walk, and they, they, their legs are wobbly and they stumble and they fall down, we don't say, you loser, you moron, you failure, you're never going to amount to anything. 
No. <laughs> we encourage them. All right, it's okay. Get back up. Get back up and keep going. And that's what we need to do for ourselves. You're going to mess up sometimes. And it's okay. Nobody's going to condemn you. We're going to say, it's okay. Come on, just come to Jesus. He's going to help you. Let him empower you to grow up in every way into Christ. So as his disciple, I must first deny myself. And we've talked plenty of, about that. I have to deny myself. I love what Todd said, that when you feed your flesh and your ungodly desires and passions, they grow. So if you're struggling with a substance addiction or a sex addiction, or, your, or even a food addiction, whatever. If you're struggling with some sin or temptation in your life, the more you feed it, the more you give into your flesh, the more it's going to grow and grow and grow and become more powerful. But if you deny yourself, you take authority over your flesh and your carnal nature, you're going to starve it to death. And so the more you feed your spirit, man... The things of God, righteousness, holiness, and truth, the more your spirit man or your spirit woman is going to grow. Number two is take up my cross. The cross was the place of crucifixion. And every day as believers, we have to die to self. Number three, the last one is follow Jesus. You know, there are many fans of Jesus, many people who would say, oh yeah, I'm a fan of Jesus, I like Jesus. But spiritual growth and maturity and true discipleship isn't about liking Jesus. It's about becoming like Jesus. It's not enough to just like him. It's not enough just to come in and, and just sing some songs of praise. It's true spiritual growth and maturity is following his example, living like Jesus lived and, and laying our lives down for others. Amen? All right. Go ahead and stand to your feet. This is very basic, but we know before we went to Africa, the Lord said, go back to the first things. Go back to the things that you taught in the beginning so that you can fan into flame that fire and so that every Christian, every believer at Radiant Church will grow up spiritually in every way. That's God's heart for each of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we pray the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 when he said, Father, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because of it. And Lord, we realize that the world hated you, the world despised you, so we will not be afraid, astonished, or devastated when we go through the same things that you went through, similar things that you went through. We thank you for your word, and Lord, we know it wasn't written for our information, it was written for our transformation. And God, we want to be transformed by your word. And we pray that every person at Radiant Church will be deeply rooted and grounded in your truth. And that they will be deeply rooted and grounded in the church and the body of Christ. So that no enemy would be able to pluck them out, up and, and cast them out. And Lord, we pray that every single believer at Radiant will grow up in every way into Christ. And that every single one of us will fulfill your will and purpose for our lives. May we love you more deeply and know you more intimately. Oh God, we surrender lordship to you. We decree there's only one Lord here and that's Jesus, King Jesus. There's only one Lord here in this church. The church is yours, Lord. You're the Lord of the church. And unless you build it, we labor in vain. So we say, Lord, build your church and simply use us to make it stronger. And for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God praise.